So we're now going to look at Unit 5, which is Safeguarding and Protection in Care Settings. 1.1 1 .1 asks you to explain the term safeguarding. Now all you have to do is give a definition of that term and then explain what safeguarding means to you. So we know that safeguarding is protecting people from any potential or real harm, abuse or neglect. Everyone has got a right to live that life free from harm, abuse and neglect. It's about promoting people's well-being, making sure that they're safe, allowing them to be independent and promoting and respecting their individual rights. So for 1.1, just give a definition of safeguarding and explain what it means to you. 1.2 then asks you to explain your own role in safeguarding and protecting others. So what you have to do then is look at your own role. So maybe get your job description and look at what your job description says you must do in order to safeguard and protect vulnerable people. And then explain what you do in your day-to-day -day work in order to safeguard. We know that our own role is to comply with policies and procedures. So have a look at your safeguarding policy. Write about what it says you have to do in order to comply with that role, comply with those responsibilities to safeguard those vulnerable people. We know that we need to keep up to date by attending relevant safeguarding training. We know that we have to comply with safe working practices. So what you have to do within this answer is explain your role and responsibilities to comply with safeguarding and the protection of vulnerable people. What you do on a day-to-day -day basis that constitutes to that safeguarding. So by using equipment, you're safeguarding that individual because you're complying with safe working practices. By wearing your PPE, you're safeguarding them or putting them at less risk from any cross-contamination and you're maintaining infection control. So you're therefore safeguarding them from any neglect. What do you do in your work practice on a daily day basis that might safeguard that individual? And that's what we want to know about. 1.3 asks you to define the following terms. So it's given you a list of 10 types of abuse and what you have to do is give a definition and meaning of each one of them. So just write one or two sentences that explains and gives the definition of each of those identified 10 types of abuse. 1.4 asks you to describe the term harm. Now we know that harm is that deliberately inflicted physical or emotional, emotional injury on a person. And what I would suggest doing for this answer is give a couple of examples in your work practice where that may occur or you've known that it's happened. So where there's been that physical attack, that emotional inflicted injury on a person that's resulted in harm. 1.5 asks you to describe the term restrictive practice. So we know restrictive practice is the use of physical force, the use of restraint, secluding or isolating an individual. But we know this isn't common practice. We know it's not something we should do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's only as and when there's appropriate assessments in place, so dolls assessments, so where by we can justify depriving someone of their human rights and their liberties in their best interest. So what you need to look at is a description of the types of physical restraints or practices we use and explain them. 2.1 asks you to identify the signs and symptoms associated with those types of abuse that you've identified in 1.3. So those 10 types of abuse that you've already identified, you then need to list and look at the signs and symptoms associated with each, each of them. So go down your list and explain how you'd identify each type of abuse. What are the physical indicators that we're looking for that might suggest that type of abuse has taken place? So for physical abuse, you're gonna be looking for those bruises. For sexual abuse, you might look for any unwanted STIs unwanted pregnancies, that irrational washing or reluctance to uh, sort of like bathe or shower or overcompensating by showering more. 
So what are the signs and physical indicators and symptoms of each category of abuse? 2.2 asks you to describe the factors that contribute to an individual being more vulnerable than others. So we need to look at a range of things. So for example, a person with dementia, they've got that cognitive impairment to be able to retain information or make decisions. That in itself makes them vulnerable. A person with poor mobility, that's unable to take themselves to the toilet, get food, get drink, access facilities, that makes them more vulnerable because they're then dependent on others. A person of a different background or a different, different ethnic minority might be subject to some kind of prejudice or discrimination. They're therefore vulnerable. So look at the types of people you work with. Think about the factors that makes them particularly vulnerable than others. Their age, their disability, medical conditions, and what is it about them that makes them vulnerable? 3.1 asks you to explain what actions you'd take if you suspected abuse is taking place. Now my take on this is that you would always assume abuse is taking place until it's proven otherwise. But if you suspect that it's occurred, you need to act on that suspicion at the earliest opportunity. Get your internal whistleblowing procedure, have a look at what that says you have to do and write about it. So you need to describe the procedure you follow when there's suspicions in your own work practice and relate it to your internal whistleblowing procedure. Because every procedure, although it's somewhat standard, they may differ slightly from setting to setting. So get your own policy, look at what that says about raising suspicions, what procedure you need to follow and write about it. 3.2 asks you to explain the actions you take if an individual alleges to you that abuse has taken place. So although in 3.1 you've probably looked at your whistleblowing procedure and the procedure you'd follow, this time abuse has taken place and you've got the evidence to suggest that. So your whistleblowing policy applies. You have to give your manager enough time to investigate it because it's not your um, responsibility to investigate. You have to follow your normal whistleblowing procedure. However, this time there may be other people that need to know. So because in the event it's a um, sexual abuse, it's then a criminal matter. Police may need to be informed. If your manager doesn't act on, act on or take those concerns seriously, you may need to take it higher to the perhaps owner or the proprietors. And if the owners of the company doesn't take it seriously, we then look at going further to the local safeguarding board and then perhaps CQC. So what is the procedure to follow in the event that abuse has taken place and think about who we need to contact in what order? What's the correct procedure we need to follow? 3.3 asks you to explain ways to ensure that evidence is preserved. So what we need to look at within your answer is what do you do in order to make sure that the evidence you come across in the event of any abuse isn't tampered with, isn't compromised. We need to make sure it's safe and secure until those investigating can get hold of it or till the police come to do their bit. So we need to make sure that the room is safe and secure that no evidence is tampered with. You may take photographs, but just be mindful that in the event of sexual abuse taking place, you wouldn't encourage an individual to shower or bathe or wash any clothes, because that is evidence and that's you tampering with evidence that might lead to um, criminal proceedings. And it's, it's, it's gonna be evidence that's used in that investigation, in that disciplinary, in them court proceedings so we want to avoid tampering with any of that so don't do anything with it just preserve it make sure it's safe and secure wait till the people who need to see it are there take photographs encourage the individual not to shower not to bathe make sure you keep any data or records confidential and that's one way or a few ways we can make sure that evidence is preserved until the investigation has taken place. 
4.1 asks you to identify the relevant legislation, local systems or national policies that relate to safeguarding and protecting those individuals from abuse. So you're going to have to do some research into those systems, the laws, the legislation that looks at safeguarding individuals. So for example, the Mental Capacity Act 2005, that has five key principles on decision making. Look at what that legislation states in terms of safeguarding that individual from abuse and how we promote decision making for that individual. You may work for a local authority whereby they've got an internal policy that you know you have to follow. So for example, those that work in Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham and Sheffield, they have to follow and comply with the South Yorkshire safeguarding procedure. So that's a local system that anyone in those four areas have to follow. Look at what other government policies are in place. Look at the laws around safeguarding. So do some research and write about each legislation that you identify. 4.2 asks you to explain the roles of different agencies in safeguarding and protecting vulnerable people from abuse. So you need to look at who's out there and what the role they play in protecting people. So, for example, your local authority, their local safeguarding board, they have a duty to respond to and act upon, investigate any um, forms or reported incidents of abuse. What role do they play in protecting that individual from abuse? So look at the role of the local authority. Look at the role of the police in investigating any criminal or civil wrongdoings. The VBS, so the Vetting and Barring Service, they provide a vital role in making sure that anyone that's barred from working with adults or children when applying for new jobs aren't actually given that opportunity based on that barring list. So the DBS, so the Disclosure and Barring Service, when you apply for a new job, part of that recruitment process is to make sure that you've got uh, an enhanced DBS from that DBS service. So looking at any criminal or civil wrongdoings, any list that you're barred on to make sure that those children and adults are protected when applying for that new role. So think about all the agencies involved and the role they play in protecting and safeguarding vulnerable people from abuse and write about them. 4.3 asks us to look at the factors that contribute or have appeared in local and national case failures. So whereby reports have been produced into systematic failures to safeguard vulnerable people and children. We need to look at what those failures were and write about them. So you're going to do some research and look at locally in your own area and nationally up and down this country whereby care homes, hospital settings, any other health and social care related setting that you may work in has failed to provide a duty of care and to safeguard those individuals. You need to write about what the failures were and what they could have perhaps done better to prevent that from occurring. So we're going to look at three different case studies over the next three short clips. What I want you to look at is what were the failures within those case studies? Have you identified any others as part of that research? And how are you going to prevent it from happening in your work setting? So by researching case failures locally and nationally, you'll be able to identify what went wrong in those cases to prevent them then happening in your own setting. So in the case of baby P then, or Peter Connolly, um, it was a young baby, 17 months old, that died in 2007. What we know about this case is that it was very unfortunate and it shouldn't have happened. There was a lot of professionals that didn't safeguard baby P. Poor Peter was on an at-risk register. He was known to child protection and yet a lot of services failed him. There was over 60 reports in, from different professionals that knew about baby P that yet failed to act in his best interest and take care of him and recognised that he was actually being subject to neglect and abuse. There was over 50 physical injuries recorded at the time of baby P's death. This shouldn't have happened. The system failed him. His parents failed him. 
there was a lot of unanswered questions. So when you're looking at baby P, look at what his parents did not to safeguard him and what the professionals failed to do, which then resulted unfortunately in baby P's death. Write about those failures, write about those wrongdoings and look at what could have been done differently to prevent it from happening. Who could have intervened sooner? What interventions could have been made? Could his death been, have been prevented? So in 2008 then, sadly, Kyra Ishak lost her life. She was subject to a lot of sadistic behaviour by her parents and died consequently as malnourishment. She was severely underweight. Her parents wouldn't allow access to the foods that was in the home. They used to lock the cupboards, make her overeat till she was physically sick, give her cold baths, beat her. She had over 60 injuries on her body at the time of her death in 2008. So Kyra was subject to a lot of neglect by her parents, physical abuse, which then resulted in her death. She was taken out of school, apparently to homeschool, when in, in reality what was happening is that her parents were actually beating her at home. 60 injuries, lack of food, malnourishment, it is all neglect. It resulted in death. Look into what happened to Kyra. Write about those failures. Write about how those parents failed to meet the basic needs of their child and again what we want to do is prevent this from happening in the future so look at what preventatives we can take from those wrongdoings that we've identified so in 2011 then a bristol care home called winterbourne view was found neglectful and responsible for the abuse of a lot of people within the home that had learning disabilities now it took an undercover journalist working for BBC Panorama to apply for a job, go in and uncover all this using hidden cameras. There was a lot of abuse taking place from morning till night. People plotting to do this abuse. Since the case, 11 people have been subject to criminal convictions. But the abuse that taken place within the home was horrific. It showed you on the footage them interviewing the families who spoke quite well about the home that were saying every time that they went to visit, they were taken to the family room, they were meant to feel welcome. So to them, they felt as though they, they, their loved ones, their children, these with learning disabilities were actually being cared and looked after. But behind closed doors, they was actually being forced to take medication, restrained using furniture, having their hair pulled, slapped, these staff plotting and ringleading as to how they're going to abuse these individuals. It's horrific to watch, but the reality of it, reality of it is it occurred. And it occurred in a care setting where people should be looked after. So do some research into Winterbourne View. Look at those systematic failures. Look at the unfortunate abuse that these people with learning disabilities and challenging behaviour were subject to and write about them. Look at what these 11 people have been convicted for and again, write about them. Because again, what we want to do is to prevent this happening in the future. We know that this kind of abuse shouldn't be tolerated and we need to prevent it from happening. 4.4 asks you to look at the sources of support or information that can help you with safeguarding vulnerable people from abuse. Now we all know we've got internal policies and procedures to follow. So start with that, look at your policy, look at the information it gives you, that'll give you the right advice and guidance you need to follow your roles and responsibilities and comply with safe working practices. There's also people you can go to, such as your colleagues, your manager, you may have an area manager, or maybe the owner of the home, but there are appropriate channels we have to follow. There's websites we can look on. Skills for Care is an amazing website and it's specific to the care sector that can give you a lot of information and advice. The Care Quality Commission, so CQC, they also have a website and they also have got useful contact numbers. You can phone them for advice. 
that when we think about reporting concerns, remember your whistleblowing procedure, you're only looking at these organisations like Skills for Care, CQC, for advice regarding safeguarding, what to do, what's best practice. Skills for Care also have a Code of Professional Conduct which tells you how to safeguard and protect vulnerable people. So read that and that'll give you guidance and information on how to safeguard people. There's lots of sources of support and information out there. It's about you accessing them. But for this assessment criteria, you need to write about who they are, what can you read, who are the people we can go to, what organisations can we access in order to safeguard and protect vulnerable people. 4.5 asks you to identify when to seek support in situations that's beyond your own expertise. So if you come across a particular situation that you feel quite worried about, that you're concerned about, that you haven't dealt with before, act on that. Don't keep it in. It's important to seek that advice, to read your policies, read your procedures, see what that says you must do. Speak to another colleague or speak to your manager. A problem shared is a problem halved. And if you can let someone know that you're struggling or unsure, I'm sure someone can give you the right and relevant information. We need to make sure that any safeguarding issues or concerns are passed on and acted on. So if you're unsure or uncertain, seek that support, seek that advice, read your policy, ask your line manager or ask a colleague that you feel comfortable speaking with. 5.1 asks you to look at how working effectively with person-centred values and promoting independence and actively involving a person in the care that they receive. How does that then reduce the likelihood of abuse taking place? Well, if you're following an individual's care plan, if you're meeting their care needs, if you're doing what's been agreed and what's been asked of you, you're then going to reduce that likelihood of abuse taking place because you're therefore meeting their needs, their wishes, their preferences. You're promoting choice. You're encouraging their choice of lifestyle. You're showing courage. You're treating them with dignity and respect. You're promoting all those fundamental care values and person-centred care values, which then reduces the likelihood of abuse taking place. By you actively involving that individual in the care that they receive, that's allowing them to be actively involved and being on sort of like the receiving end of a service and being actively involved with that rather than passively involved with that. Because too often we just do for a person uh, because we understand what they want, because we know what they might choose, but we need to get them actively involved and support choices, support informed choices, gain consent. That fundamental care value underpins our work ethic underpins the, that care plan and everything that we stand for and what we work for. So we need to make sure we're actively um, complying with them in order to reduce the likelihood of abuse taking place. So what you've got to do is write about how you comply with these care values of choice, dignity, respect, independence, active participation, and look at how they then reduce abuse from taking place because you're actively involving them. You're promoting independence, which is then giving them choice. So to meet assessment criteria 5.1, look at your care values, write about them and explain how complying with them reduces abuse from taking place. 5.2, you've got to explain the importance of having an accessible complaints procedure. So the importance of having it accessible is so people know how to access it. If they're unable to access that complaint procedure, know where to find it, don't understand it, they're therefore not going to complain. And a complaint or being able to complain is a fundamental right. We don't learn from mistakes. We can't improve our practice. We can't put, make things better unless people complain. And it's their right to complain. So making it accessible, making it open and transparent, making it visible to everyone, Promoting their right to complain allows them to. It then reduces abuse from taking place because it allows us to learn from those complaints, make changes, take appropriate steps to prevent them from happening again. 5.3 asks us to look at or outline how abuse can be reduced through risk management and prevention. 
Within your work setting, you'll have some risk assessments, which is usually a five step process to identifying a risk and putting control measures in place to reduce that risk or prevent it from happening full stop. What this then does is reduces the likelihood of abuse taking place because you're gonna look at preventing or reducing any harm or injury by identifying that associated risk and using your risk assessment to reduce that. So by focusing on preventatives, we always say prevention is cheaper than the cure. So look at preventing it by your risk assessment processes or reducing it where able if you can't prevent it like in full. So that's how prevention and risk management reduces abuse from taking place because you're controlling that risk, you're reducing it, you're preventing it where able through appropriate control measures. So look at, for example, mobility. Mobility, when people cannot mobilise, is a risk. So we're going to have a risk assessment to reduce that risk through safe training, complying with safe working practices, using equipment, all of which reduce the likelihood of physical abuse taking place because we're not likely to harm or injure them if we use equipment, if we comply with that training, if we follow safe systems of work, if we make sure that there's a second carer when we're using a hoist, all of which then prevents risk from occurring. So to meet 5.3, look at your risk assessments in your work practice, look at how you follow them, perhaps pick one or two risk assessments out and write about them. Look at those risks, look at the preventatives and why you comply with them in order to reduce abuse. 6.1 asks you to describe or look at unsafe practices that can have an impact, a negative impact, on an individual's well-being. So think about day-to-day -day in your own organisation, in your own setting. What do you do that might have a negative impact, if done wrongly, on that individual's well-being? So if we didn't use that equipment, if we didn't wear our protective equipment, like our gloves and our aprons, if we didn't wash our hands, if we didn't comply with policies and procedures, if we didn't follow safe administration measures when giving out medication, if we followed other people's wrongdoings, if we didn't agree to and follow care plan, what's the negative impact on an individual's well-being? So think about in your own work setting, think about what may occur that is unsafe and describe those situations. 6.2 and 6.3 ask you to look at what the procedure is you'd follow in the event that you identify unsafe practices. And if you do report an unsafe practice and it doesn't get dealt with appropriately, timely, who you'd then go to. So in order to meet assessment criteria 6.2 and 6.3, refer back to your whistleblowing procedure, look at how you'd report an unsafe practice, write about it and then what you'd do in the event that your manager, the owner, doesn't act on your concerns, who could you then go to? Think about that next step in that whistleblowing procedure. Would it be the local safeguarding authority? Would it be the police? Would it be the Care Quality Commission? Think about the other people that may need to be involved once you've given your manager that time to investigate and they then perhaps failed to do so, or they haven't took your concerns seriously. So look back to your whistleblowing procedure. Again, write about who you'd report to and when, and who else might we need to get involved in the event that unsafe practices has been identified and then perhaps not been dealt with. 7.1 asks you to look at the risks associated with using electronic devices such as your iPad or your mobile phone, going online and using social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and making financial transactions online. And yes, they're convenient, and yes, it may be easy, but there are a lot of risks associated with that. If you think about the information stored on your phone, that's a lot of data, a lot of personal numbers, a lot of personal information. If that's not protected, it may be subject to a data breach. It could get into the wrong hands. You might compromise that trust you've got in someone by having their number because you aren't protecting that information. Online, you could be subject to uh, cyber stalking, cyber bullying, whereby you're, you fell victim to someone's harassment because of your profile picture, 
because of their dislike to you, because of your presence on social media. And while social media does connect people, it equally disconnects people because of that cyber stalking, because of that bullying harassment, because of the negative vibes and comments that's given on your pictures, on your statuses. It can be quite a daunting place for some people for that reason. You may be subject to um, inappropriate links whereby they take you to inappropriate content, which is then a phishing scam because they're then going to ask you for personal information, such as your bank details. They might present themselves as someone in authority like HMRC when you know or you might fear that it is HMRC, so you may um, give them that information they want and it might necessarily be the people you think it is. We don't often know the person behind that screen, so we need to be careful. You are going to be exploited. There are some nasty people online looking to exploit you. So what you need to do is look at the risks associated with using these devices. What are the risks associated with using your iPad online? What are the risks associated with carrying out financial transactions online? Are your bank details safe? Who could go get those details and what are the risks associated? 7.2 asks you to look at ways to reduce those risks from taking place. So the ones that you spoke about in 7.1, the ones that you've identified, now I need to know how you're going to reduce them. So if you've identified a potential data breach by using your mobile phone or your iPad, I would hope that to reduce that risk, you'd have it password protected. You'd use Face ID. You might use a two-factor authentication, which most devices now have available. You need to make sure that your internet has a built-in firewall protection, that it has virus, antivirus software to prevent or reduce the risks from occurring. Make sure that staff have access to the data protection policy and confidentiality agreements aimed to reduce that breach in data protection. Make sure that staff are trained to understand GDPR and their, the principles of the general data protection regulations to, again, to prevent that breach. So the risks you've identified in 7.1, how are you going to reduce them in 7.2? What steps do you need to put in place to make sure staff know or that you know how to reduce those risks from occurring? For 7.3, you need to explain the importance of finding a balance between in using electronic devices and that balance between online safety. So whilst we agree that you know electronic devices and working online has its benefits, we have to find that balance to make sure that you and others are safe online. People are there to exploit you. So by attending training, giving people knowledge and understanding of their policies and procedures, by letting them know what their expectations are, by informing them of their job roles and responsibilities, upskilling their knowledge and the behaviours, and letting, informing them of how to find that balance, we would expect staff, employees, yourself to know that yes, the internet's a wonderful place, but we equally need to manage ourselves and others safely online.